Hey and welcome to another video. On a recent video I did, we had uh, a question, a comment put underneath about uh, possibly a quick video on, on zone profiles and uh, best practice uh, for the zone profile. So I think we're just going to run through it quickly, explain sort of how you kind of get to these figures and, and why, uh, and then just a quick look at the, the zone profile itself. So within the zone profile, so in Panorama, if you go into it in Panorama, it's network, you go to the uh, there's template as well that you're using obviously for your for your zone protection. Um, and then it's in zone protection as you can see, we can see here and on the firewall, it's in the same place, but without the, the template. So zone protection there, okay. So we'll do a quick, just a quick run through of, of the zone protection profile itself. Also we've got a name in the description, always makes sense. Um, and then we have flood protection, reconnaissance protection, packet based protection, protocol protection, and ethernet SGT. And that's gonna be out of scope for this video because that's to do with Cisco TrustSec security. Okay, so within, within the SIN uh, flood protection, we have actually two options. We have a uh, random early drop, and we have SIN cookies. Uh, and they they vary in two very distinct ways. So random early drop is basically, it's agnostic of whether the traffic is good or bad. So if you start to hit the alarm rate, the activate rate and the maximum, and you start to go through those, then it will just start to, as it says, randomly early drop. Okay, um, it's the same as age old Cisco stuff, um, random early drop, it's not weighted, it will just drop at random. Uh, UDP, Again, now with UDP and ICMP, other IP and ICMP v6, now we're just looking at um, basic alarm rates, activate rates and maximums. Um, these really you would want to look to tune with regard really to your own environment and your own, um, your own security posture. Uh, and that's really the same can be said for, for SIN as well. So. The important difference between random early drop and SIN cookies is, as you can see, so it defaults basically to having an activate of uh, connections per second zero. And the reason connections per second activate zero is there is because SIN cookies works differently. So every TCP SIN, the firewall answers it and checks to see if it's uh, gonna be like a, a half open connection, it's gonna be left open, whether there's any kind of, um, anything that deviates from a standard uh, three-way handshake, a standard TCP handshake, just to avoid people trying to exhaust uh, resources on the firewall or resources on any, any other server by having loads of half open connections and embryonic connections. Okay, and reconnaissance protection again, we, we come into, uh, as it says there, we've got TCP port scan, host sweep and UDP port scan. And this is where you start to pick up uh, people running an MMAP against you. I have a constant um, a constant issue with being scanned by Zgrab vulnerability scanner um, which is targeted against more specifically 32400 which is my um, or everybody's Plex port unless they've changed it um, and in here really you want to look at initially you want to start looking at enabling it but having it on alert because um, you can get a lot of false positives you can get false positives from from inside and and uh, and outside and it can stop legitimate traffic but obviously over time you would start to uh, you would start to get a baseline um for alert i would say that those settings are probably okay they're just about right i mean i, I don't see why you'd want to necessarily change them um and then that's simply a case of enabling them now of course lots of companies lots of places have today they have uh, vulnerability scanners they have third parties coming in and doing um all manner of things that they, they test in, ping in, uh, port scan sweeps and stuff like that. Um, so called in inverted commas, um, offensive security companies and so on that are just running scripts off of, off of Kali Linux. Um, and so for those types of things, you would want to make sure that doesn't trigger your reconnaissance protection, doesn't trigger that and give you loads of alerts or potentially block anything they're trying to do where they're trying to scan inside so that's where your source address exclusion would come from so we just exclude the source address what type of source address it is it covers ipv4 and ipv6 uh, and then that's that means that that will be allowed through it's source address exclusion that's what it does uh, so packet based 
attack protection is where we start as you can see ip drop tcp drop icmp drop and so on now the ip options part of this um i would suggest for an outside this is this is the one where the um internet and internal does start to differ when you start to look at best practice um best practice advice and best practice from Palo themselves and it kind of sort of makes sense as well in a way and, and not in another but it definitely saves cycles on on the firewall so for the ip options these specifically these here i would always tick all of these um there is literally no reason there is no reason to allow somebody with strict source routing or loose source routing coming in strict source routing loose source routing allows the client to dictate the path that the traffic will take through a network um, can be used it admittedly you would have to have prior knowledge of the network and you'd have to spend some time in the network first to use that but that does mean that if somebody has got that knowledge and they've got they have found some way of subverting your traffic flow through the firewall they can dictate how that packet gets through the network and they can uh, they can move around the firewall. Uh, it's also worth noting as well that this, these are options on Cisco routers. I believe in some of the latest IOSs and certainly IOS XE and, and things like this, they're on by default, they're, they're dropped by default. Timestamps, um, I, I don't see why you'd need somebody either way uh, putting the timestamp IP option in. A uh, recalled route obviously speaks for itself. You don't want necessarily people to record the route. The security IP header, um, it refers back to some uh, Department of Defense thing. Uh, but again, why would anybody want to be adding that to, um, to the IP packets coming into your network? Same for stream ID unknown and malformed, to be honest with you. I mean, unknown makes sense. If it's unknown, then it's clearly not formed properly. Um, and malformed is, is malformed and that can take, I mean, that could really cover a whole series of, of um, different type of attacks where the, the packet isn't quite correct and it's trying to force the firewall to do, to do other things. Uh, with regard to the spoofed IP and strict IP address check and fragmented traffic, I mean, fragmented traffic is obviously something that is, that is something that is up for debate, whether you want to allow fragmented traffic or not, it still needs to be reassembled inside. There is many, many attacks that, um, that make use of fragmented traffic. Uh, so that's kind of, you'd have to sort of debate that. But then again, once again, you know, you know it, if somebody's sending oversized packets to your external interface, um, you wouldn't necessarily want them to be, uh, to come through because there's something not quite right there. Uh, spoofed IP address. So uh, basically, is what it says it is. It makes a check on the routing table. It's uh, if you remember the old Cisco reverse path forwarding. It makes sure that the ingress interface uh, for that IP is the the IP address that your um, sorry the ingress zone sorry is the the things reachable. The the IP is reachable back out of that. That interface and zone and then strict IP address check is exactly the same. It makes sure that you absolutely can reach that um, that IP address by going back out of that, that interface. Um, they do say to switch it off for external interfaces, for internet facing inter interfaces. Um, I tend to agree. I think basically, uh, you know, this is coming from this is coming from the internet. Pretty much everything upstream can't root RFC addresses anyway and won't do. So um pretty much everything would match it on the routing table because the routing table out to the internet is is all zeros uh whereas for inside of course any zones inside in uh in t inside like dmz even i would i would suggest or anything towards your servers or anything anywhere where you know for a fact there is a specific routing table behind that and you've got ips behind that you want to check that so that you haven't got somebody trying to spoof an ip address tcp drop is again what it says. Um, so by default, you've got TCP SYN with data, which you wouldn't want to have. TCP SYN ACK with data, same again. You've got the reject non-SYN TCP, and you can either do that globally or yes or no based on this on this zone. The global is to reject non-SYN non TCP. And then asymmetric path, again, you've got a global, you can drop or bypass it. There's lots of different reasons why you may want to, to allow those. 
Um, stripping the TCP options again is a TCP timestamp or fast open. It will it will uh, strip those options off. Mismatched overlapping TCP segment again comes down to the whole thing of uh, varying attacks that can be carried out by overlapping your TCP and having it put back together in a certain way. And then split handshake. Um, I had to do a little bit of research into this myself, to be honest, uh, but. It turns out there is something called a simultaneous open handshake. Um, everybody's familiar with the uh, TCP three-way handshake, um, where you've got SYN, SYN, ACK, ACK, and that's all good. Uh, but apparently a completely legitimate way of doing it is to, to have both sides initiate the handshake at the same time. Um, and you can carry out that attack. So, And what it does is it, it flips from the inside, so basically what was initially a um, an external an entirely external connection now appears to be coming from inside because as the malicious client comes in they set off the the simultaneous open handshake process and the uh, server on the inside replies the same way and it looks at the firewalls if it's coming from inside icmp drop um, it's just the options that you might want to drop. I mean, ICMP is useful in networks. It is, I don't see any legitimate reason for anything over uh, 124 unless you are trying to um, probe a network and trying to see at what point it needs to fragment the traffic so you can start to send fragmented traffic and, uh, and maybe try and compromise something. Again, ICMP fragments, um, discard ICMP embedded with error message. So if there's an error message in there, Really, if somebody's using ICMP for a legitimate reason, just trying to ping a server, see if it works, they're not going to send anything with an error message. Uh, again, I think in most environments, you would say that this is pretty much safe to turn them all on. And then you've got the IPv6 drop and IP, uh, ICMP v6 drop. Um, and this is all down to, I'm not an IPv6 expert by any stretch of imagination, but again, you've got, because you've got lots more extensions and things like this with IPv6, and there's stuff that you know, I mean, for instance, needless fragment header. I mean, you, I don't know why you would see that as being uh, a legitimate use. And then they've obviously pre-selected certain ones um, for with much greater knowledge than myself. Protocol protection gives you the opportunity to, it's either an exclude or include list. So you can either include it or you, uh, or you can exclude it, as it makes sense. Um, so exclude list uses implicit allow for all non-listed protocols. So if you use an exclude list, all protocols are allowed with the exception of what's in here. And then of course it also follows that if it's an include list, then include list, it says it at the bottom, uses implicit deny for all non-listed protocols. So if you have include list and you have a certain protocol and only that protocol is going to go through here or only these protocols are going to go through this particular zone, you can do an include list and only those protocols will make it through. So, and everything else will just be dropped. Okay, so that's that's the actual zone protection profile itself and configuring the zone protection profile. As always, you can click on the question mark at the top and it will, get, it will take you to a help page and you can see uh, the help page. And really, I suppose the next thing to talk about is how we get to these figures. How do we work out what these best figures are? And that really, to be honest, it's, it's a two, it's kind of a two-pronged approach to working out what they should be because not only have you got to take into consideration your firewall, um, but you've also got to take into consideration your environment. I Very rarely, I think, you'll see uh, a firewall that's in an environment that is right on the very edge. It's literally, you know, and, and if, it, if you do get to the point where you've got a firewall that is really struggling, it's really undersized, um, I would imagine at that point it's, pro it's probably due for renewal and somebody's looking at, at taking it out. But of course at that point you'd have to you'd have to really pay attention to these and tune these down um, to make sure that you're not dropping legitimate traffic. Uh, SYN cookies of course will make sure that you're only allowing through traffic that appears legitimate, as in it's not trying to flood the system and exhaust the resources, but of course that takes up resources on the firewall. So if your firewall is already sort of um, it's already at, at a high level, then you know you you, you should uh, you should start to tune that that down a bit. 
Okay, so we'll go and have a look at the Palo Alto website and how we start to compare the different firewalls and look at the connections per second. Um, and then we'll look at the how you look at the connections per second on uh, on the firewall using the health tab from Panorama and, and so on. Okay, so now on the on the Palo Alto website, we're going to look at starting comparing stuff and just have a, a quick sort of conversation about um, how the connections per second and, and so on are, 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 are sort of how those figures have come to. So really, the the throughput, the threat prevention through, throughput, and the app ID throughput and so on is is governed mainly by the cores that are on the uh, the the box or the VM. Obviously, in my lab, everything's a VM. Um, I do sometimes use my 220, but frankly, if I'm being honest, for lab work, the 220 is just the biggest nightmare in the world because the, the 20 minute commit times just mean that if you drop anything, it's just like, oh wow, I've got to wait another 40 minutes, man. So, as far as, as, far as that's concerned with my lab, for instance, has uh, two uh, CPUs and eight gig, which kind of puts it roughly sort of here. Um, so I think it could comfortably handle 15,000 uh, connections per second. I think it could because that's 6.5. I don't think it would touch 30,000 by any stretch of the imagination. Um, the thing with it is as well with VM series, just really quickly, is also you have to understand as well that although the firewall thinks it's got these resources and that's okay, it has to be built in a certain way. So if you have a core that's on a firewall, a vCPU on a, on a firewall, that has to be paired to a physical core. It can't be spread across cores because then you get wait times for CPU and, and it becomes a whole big mess. So the virtualization of firewalls, really they need to have their own resources which are, um, which are reserved for them and of course in addition to that as well is the fact that it goes a lot, as I understand, it goes a lot deeper than somebody who has a working knowledge of, of uh, ESXi and so on, and VMware uh, as I do, but somebody who really knows what they're talking about will be able to explain about getting the, um, the, the virtual cores and the physical cores and the memory matched up and, and reserved specifically for the firewall. So in your first instance, this is where you're going to kind of look so we have, um, in another lab, we have some VM700s. We have VM700s with 16 CPUs and 56 gig of, of RAM. So we've got 120,000 connections per second. And if we just pop down here and have a look, these, these protection profiles are built on those, um, on those stats because these are built specifically for a VM700. So we have the SYN cookies on the internet protection, uh, which got an alarm rate of, of 90,000. That's purely and simply because these are, they're untested yet. They're not, um, they're, they're not in production. They've not been put into production. And we, we, we don't know what kind of connections they're going to get. The reality of that figure is that you would probably drop it right down. So after, the alarm rate, bear in mind it's just an alarm, so I would be tempted to drop this down to maybe 10,000, something like that. Um, 10,000 connections per second is, is quite a busy firewall for a small company, um, and that's what I'd, I'd be tempted to do. But with this being sync cookies, it, it kind of, it's a bit different really, because that's more just an alerting uh, process. So the activation again, we got the zero. So we've got zero connections per second because we want sync cookies to activate straight away. We want it to always be on. And then the maximum connections per second is based on 10,000 below the maximum connections for the uh, the firewall itself. Um, we'll talk about the trend in, in a minute. And then these are just the, these are just the, uh, the default values just based on the fact it's going into, these are being specifically built for a very large network um, and these will be tuned. So if we never ever see an alarm rate, we'll then sort of iteratively bring these down until we start to see alarm rates and start to see things uh, of, of that nature. The reconnaissance protection again, as I say, is all set in alert, set in alert because we need to start seeing the alerts from it and 
um, sort of work out whether we're getting a lot of false positives and then we can start looking to to block uh, port scans or if we've got something where we specifically it's going on a firewall that specifically does as I said before it shouldn't ever see a port scan uh, it should only see straight connections to um, IP uh, IP and ports then you know you uh, sort of activate it so put it on block this is the internet protection so it has all the IP options ticked because there's no reason no legitimate reason for them to be hitting you from the internet uh, and we left fragmented traffic open uh, as we discussed previously TCP drop we've got uh, everything sort of there we've got everything uh, ticked there um, ICMP drop again we're dropping those that we don't uh, that we don't need uh, TTL expired could you could put it in you could put it uh, I'm not that sure uh, protocol protection and we haven't got anything in, in the protocol protection and then you can see for the inside protection on this particular one same model of firewall um, but for here for instance we have a in the packet based attack protection we have spoofed IP address and strict IP address check and fragmented traffic because nothing on the inside should be fragmented um, so that's so that's for this one now how just simply setting say simply setting those those figures to what the firewall can handle it's never ever going to happen I mean the chances of me putting that into production and it hitting 90,000 connections per second are fairly slim so how do we get around that how do we work that out so if it's a panorama managed firewall we can come into summary yeah, sorry we can come into panorama manage devices and we can go to health and as you can see immediately I mean there's no connections per second on this because it's a it's a lab firewall there's nothing running through it but immediately we can see that we can see the connections per second okay and we have a um, we have a, a, a dialogue here specifically for this we can overlay different metrics so we can overlay connections per second packets per second uh, onto this as well um, so we can do that so then we've got an overlay of packets per second as well and we can bring this out here and we can change the um, don't change it here we can change the time for it as well if I put that back so we can change it over say the last 30 days and refresh and then the average uh, you've got time filter last 30 days so this is the time filter last 30 days if you wanted to show the average over the last 15 days let's say then we get an average line as you can see there package per second average um, and connections per second and again we can pop this out so if you were setting it sort of for this I mean that uh, you you wouldn't use these metrics obviously because I mean the moment you did see any kind of traffic um, at all it would it would break it but in this particular instance you could quite happily say okay over the last 30 days I'm gonna go for an average of 50 connections per second because looking at my traffic profile that's pretty much what I I see I see that really it hits a peak of 30 I don't want to start dropping any traffic sort of too much or alerting so I'm going to go for 50 because that is a at the very least an alert of 50 connections uh, per second is going to tell me that something has changed actually quite drastically within my network remember a lot of these things not only are they for protection but they also can provide very very valuable information as to what's actually happening within your network is are people sort of coming to it more is it has it suddenly attracted the attention of 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 um malicious actors maybe you know is there because usually in the run-up to a massive attack you will see differences in in traffic uh, traffic patterns uh, that's where heuristics comes in and that's where I mean a lot of companies have made a lot of they've made a lot of money from products that are looking for they're looking for trends they're looking for things to change they're using algorithms to see if there's anything out of the ordinary as opposed to simply saying well okay if I've got 30 packets per second then that's correct if I've got 50 packets per second that's wrong and that isn't necessarily the way to do it they're looking to prevent attacks 
by showing the ramp up to an attack uh, potentially. Okay, so that's through that's through panorama. Okay, so we're going to start looking on on the firewall now. So if we wanted to look on the firewall for these statistics, there's a couple of useful commands to know to see what the firewall's doing, see how it's see how uh, what kind of health it's in if you've got a standalone firewall as opposed to panorama. So the first thing we're going to do is going to look at uh, system statistics session. And so we can see now, the, so the firewall now, so I have a Windows box on the other side of this, and we can see this is on a follow as well, so it's following the, the statistics. So we've got packet rate, throughput, uh, total active sessions, active TCP, active UDP, and active ICMP. So if I start pinging 8.8.8, .8 for instance, we now see that we, everything is going up. So the packet rate's going up, the active ICMP sessions are going up. Um, and this would be something that we, would, we could then control. Uh, if I wanted to put some traffic through it, um, go for that. We can start putting, and you can see we, immediately the packet rates going up, the throughputs going up, um, our active sessions are going up. Okay, so that's so that's a good one. Stop that now, and then we can quit out of here. Okay, so if we want to see, for instance, as well, we can also look here. So you can also uh, auto complete this system statistics. And then we look for applications. We can see the applications are going through it. Uh, we can see the good old Yuku base. Um, and again, this is, this is sort of following. So if I go now to, um, if I go on to this this box we can see we've got lots of quick sessions quick is something you should really be blocking anyway and I don't know why I'm not necessarily we see you've got some MS team stuff popped up there MS update has popped up as now so my <clears throat> my Windows box is now looking for uh, updates and as well, we can see YouTube base has now popped in there as an application because it's seen the application coming through. So it also gives you a bit of an idea as well of how quickly the firewall starts to um, starts to detect and then starts to be able to control traffic based on uh, based on application. If we were to come out of that and we were to do show session info, so this is now where we get our um, we get our connections per second that we're trying to sort of understand and we're trying to work out now of course this is a static page so the target data plane in this particular case we have we have a VM so there is no data plane and management plane they're, they're one single thing um, and this one is actually showing a, a new connection establish rate of zero which is um, not helpful for this demonstration at all uh, so if we do that as well, so that we can also filter as well, we can say match connection and you could keep checking. So as you can see I've tried a few there whilst I've been running um, uh, a utility against the firewall. Uh, we can just do it again, start running it again. And it's not, it's not firing this time, but you can see we've got the connections per second. If that was a live firewall you'd be able to see, uh, you'd be able to see on the firewall that you've got a certain amount of connections per second and that's what you'd start to look for then within your zone protection profile you'd start to look at what the the connections per second are and then you'd start to look at 15 to 20 percent above the peak connections per second um, that really is it i mean it, it, you've got the ability to to block the traffic uh, with the zone protection profile you can offload it in certain uh, certain firewalls as well um, but it is the best practice is to have as much protection as you possibly can, but security is always a balancing act between between protection and um, usability. And of course, that's where this comes in. It's always fine tuning it. So there is no, with unless you look at the unless you're looking at sort of what a firewall can handle. There's no point having your threshold set above what the firewall can handle because obviously they'll never be triggered. 
other than that, it really is looking at your own environment, looking at your firewalls, looking at their health, looking at what they're doing, and then from there looking at what your um, at what your threshold should be and setting it specifically for you because it will be different, I would imagine, for for most for most uh, companies or most use cases. Um, okay, so that's the uh, zone protection profiles. Again, any questions? Absolutely fine. Um, please. You know, we're all, all here to learn. Any questions, any comments, um, let me know. And please like and subscribe uh, because it really does help. Cheers. Bye.